How's everyone doing today? Good, good. See, a lot of people haven't made it back in yet. They're not going to learn things that you're going to know. Think about that. <laughs> well, I just want to thank everyone for, for being a part of this conversation today. Uh, a couple of just quick disclaimers. This isn't going to be the talk where you learn that you don't have to do 800-171 or something like that. I don't have that magic trick available for you. Uh, a couple of things that we might want to get in front of yourself if you do have like a computer with you or something like that while we're talking, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe mention these things, and then you might get distracted while you're looking them up, and then you lose something. So let's just get that out of the way. Uh, two quick things. You'll notice that it, for this talk in the details, there's two links that you can click on. The first one is for these slides, which are largely useless in a static form. Uh, you're going to want to look at the second link, which is the CUI references document we put together. It just has a lot of more of, more of this information laid out in a way that's always hard to do in, in a slide form. So just maybe have that handy. We might reference it a few times. The other document that I think you should probably have pulled up even for reading later is DOD instruction 5230.24. Uh, this document was just revised like 58 days ago. And the things that are in it are gonna have a huge impact on our collective understanding of controlled and classified information. So you wanted to get those pulled up before the talk. Uh, we had to put it, get together a lot of those resources because uh, DefCert is located in the American Midwest. And we have uh, been, I think the last 14 days, 10 of those days were without power. So we have a few things that we didn't have time to get into the deck. And so uh, apologies on that. Use those additional CUI references. They sort of bridge that gap. So uh, today's talk, we're really talking about CUI as a concept, I think uh, we, we got a somewhat sanitized title here. Uh, the true title here is what the expletive is CUI, because that's really the question that we get asked the most often. It's the biggest showstopper, the biggest cause for delays or added complexity in everyone's attempts to implement NIST 800-171. So here's the situation that we find ourselves in most often. You learn about CUI as a concept somehow through a contract clause, through a, a webinar, through your local PTAC, and you learn that there's this thing called the CUI registry. Uh, you go to the CUI registry and a couple of things start to happen. You, you look at a category and you're gonna see that there is uh, just sort of a, um, for lack of a better term, a, a wall of text and you're searching for meaning in it, right? And what ends up happening is you tend to focus on the words that you are most familiar with. Cognitive bias kicks in and you start reading, oh, examples, great, let's dive in. And as time goes on, you go, wait, we have engineering drawings. And then you go, oh my God, we get specifications from customers. And wait a minute, I've seen catalog item IDs on, on, on sheets and, and things like that all the time. Oh my God, everything is CUI, just, we're screwed. And so what starts to happen in these types of situations, if we, if we take bad reasoning and start to backfeed it into everything we know about CUI as a topic, we get this ever-expanding infinite universe where either we decide, screw it, everything's CUI. Just treat everything as if it's CUI, which is like kind of a weird way of saying, I have unlimited budget. I have unlimited resources. We'll harden everything. It'll be great. Uh, and that doesn't always like survive as a strategy, right? Um, or you'll have organizations who go, I'm just going to practice some motivated blindness here until someone emerges from a beam of light and points to these three documents and says, this is the CUI. I'm not doing anything. I need better instructions. And that's probably not gonna work long-term either, especially when we are a part of a very complex supply chain. So here's what we have to accomplish. We'll try and do as much of this as we can in this talk with the knowledge that things will, will probably need to be addressed over and over again. We'll probably need to get more reps in on this, but uh, there's some outcomes we wanna shoot for in this talk. A, a good outcome for this talk would be that you can just simply spot CUI and customer data sets. Just getting that off the ground, I think, would be really important for us because of some of the revised guidance from DOD. This is actually easier to do now. We'll talk through that. An even better outcome would be that you are able to determine when your contract deliverables on your contracts qualify as CUI. That's the other side of the coin, right? We'll get as far into those discussions as we can here in a limited time. And then the best possible outcome, I think, is one where you as an organization can control your own destiny by understanding your data rights, by understanding how your proprietary information is managed, uh, how the overlay of government owned and possessed data would then uh, correlate to things that you have or things that you create would put you in a position 
to insulate your supply chain from some of these requirements, to limit the number of IT systems and business processes that are subject to safeguarding requirements. If we can get you into that territory, suddenly you get a lot of your own dynamic ability back to control what happens in this supply chain. So we will dive into that. We'll see how deep we can get. But the way we're going to do that is basically, first and foremost, to understand how the government views CUI as a concept. If we can get inside their head, we can then go through some of the rest of these processes. We'll continue that process by understanding how authorities function to actually define CUI. Then we are going to navigate the emotional roller coaster that is proprietary information and how CUI and proprietary information work together, overlap, so on and so forth. And then with whatever time we have left, we'll push back on some of the lazy CUI definitions that we so often see that maybe we've fallen victim to. And uh, from there, we'll, we'll try and get a little interactive with some of the questions. So starting first with how the government views CUI, the government in general views most things as part of a certain progression. And that progression is basically this. You're going to have a statute. A statute is either going to be like a law or an executive order that turns into a regulation. Federal rules are put out with guidance. And then finally, that becomes something that goes into our contracts, perhaps as a predefined clause or the terms of an agreement. That's the general progression by which most of government functions and then how it interacts with us. So if we sort of repeat that process, uh, we're going to go through the CUI program. We have an executive order from 2010 that says we need something called the Controlled and Classified Information Program. Uh, it's going to put together all of these uh, laws and regulations that already exist, and we're going to use it to sort of drive forward a more unified approach, not even really for any of you, but so that the government agencies can better exchange information with each other and not accidentally disclose another agency's information in a Freedom of Information Act request or a FOIA request. So this order uh, is important because it gives us the executive agent. The executive order appoints NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, to just put together and facilitate and orchestrate this whole program across all agencies. So NARA is appointed, and they begin to draft the executive order. As we learned yesterday, ISU is the sub-office responsible for that. That yields a federal rule. That federal rule is Part 2002 of 32 CFR, and this instantiates the CUI program. Uh, it's, it's mostly having a discussion with agencies. And the reason that we know that, uh, this is the, the first scoping determination we should be aware of, is that this part applies to all executive branch agencies. So that's, that's huge, right? This is sweeping across federal government. However, the next sentence says, this part does not apply directly to non-executive branch entities. Does anybody here know what a non-executive branch entity is? It's you, it's you, the private sector. You are not an agency, you are a company, you're a private organization. This part, the CUI program does not apply to you. Oh, but it does apply indirectly to any non-executive -execu branch uh, CUI recipient. And the only way that happens is through incorporation into agreements. So our first limiting factor we should be aware of here is that if we have an agreement or a contract that is the scope, the constraint inside of which things we read in the CUI program are applied to us. So just be aware that there are limits to this. This wasn't a law of the land type event that just blankets the entire country and now we are all subject to it. The only way outside of agencies to get this through to a non-executive branch entity is through an agreement. Also, really important, the CUI program gives us a definition of controlled unclassified information. If all you've ever done is read the CUI registry, and if all you've ever done is to just like go to a webinar about what CUI is, like what its characteristics are, oh, well, I mean, it's these kinds of information and you'll learn more about that in the registry and things like that, and you never go upstream to the government's definition, you will be partially blinded to some of the things that would really help you nail this down. So let's go through this. Controlled unclassified information is information that the government creates or possesses. Pay attention to possession. We will be coming back to it. Or it could also be information that an entity creates or possesses for or on behalf of the government. But no matter which one of those are true, 
It is always information that a law, regulation, or government-wide policy either requires an agency to safeguard that information or limit its dissemination or empowers them and gives them the, the ability to require other people to do that as well. And this is really important because this is the basis of being able to define CUI. In fact, we should set aside the, the concept of who created it or who possessed it for just a moment, and we should invert this order of operations and focus first on whether or not there is a law or a regulation. I'm going to set aside government-wide policy because there's only a few government-wide policies. They're mostly having to do with protecting federal buildings. So unless you're a federal building landlord, that probably doesn't apply to you directly. So let's just focus on laws and regulations. We need to find out if a law or regulation governs certain information that is in our, our realm of influence. So to do that, we just need to understand how these legal authorities, laws or regulations define CUI for us. You, you can think of CUI that's marked in a document and say, I need to figure out what CUI is. But you have to remember, laws and regulations define that for us. Uh, a marking simply identifies a document. Not all the information we need to know why it's CUI is baked in to that marking. So we have to go further. So again, most of us, when we go to the CUI registry, we're going to fall into a certain pattern. Uh, that pattern looks like reviewing the registry entry for a category, looking at the banner marking, reading the category description. Uh, here's a problem. That category description is not a definition. So if you had like a really amazing government contracts attorney go, I'm reading it right there. It says that in the description, uh, they're actually just reading a summary that NARA put together that could include multiple legal authorities. They're just kind of trying to sum it up somehow. This is not authoritative, it's not binding. So here is how we fix this. Uh, actually, we have, all of you were given these, these tins with mints in them. This, this actually gives us the key for how to do this, right? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna hold this up, right? You got left, left mouse button, right? Right mouse button. This is the one right here, you ready? Scroll, scroll. <laughs> Website designers call this below the fold. It's not the first thing you see when you, when you open up the web page. And all the way at the bottom of each category listing in the CUI registry is this little tiny font, this little tiny box, and it says safeguarding and or disseminating authority. This is your definition of CUI. That little, little link there to a downloadable PDF gives you just a section or a part of either a law, a title of US code, or a regulation, Code of Federal Regulations. And somewhere in that PDF export for that whole section is gonna be a sentence or a paragraph that actually tells you about a very specific information type that either requires safeguarding or requires controls over its dissemination. That will be your definition of CUI. So let's just look at some examples. I think I had uh, like ammonium nitrate up there or something. Let's look, maybe look at a more relevant example. Um, in a law, we will have something like this. Title 13, uh, talking about export controls, it says, hey, shippers export declarations or any document containing those kinds of information uh, have to be exempt from public disclosure unless the Secretary of Commerce says that it should be disclosed. So uh, that, that's the entire legal authority that we're talking about here. Uh, there are multiple legal authorities for export controls, but this is one of your legal authorities for the CUI category of export control. So show of hands, does anybody here work for the Department of Commerce? Is anybody here uh, a contractor paid by the Department of Commerce to process like shippers export declarations for the Department of Commerce, maybe like on government furnished equipment or anything like that? So, so none of you here would be subject to a Freedom of Information Act request to an agency that would cause the public disclosure of these shippers' records. So how could this possibly apply to you? Many, many, many of these dissemination authorities describe the activities that have to be carried out by agencies, and there just is no overlap between this and your business. So just know that the vast majority of these dissemination authorities or these safeguarding authorities are telling agencies not to slip certain information into a FOIA release. That is like the vast majority of these authorities. 
So just knowing that will help you understand that you have to cut down on the signal to noise ratio here. Uh, let's look at maybe just another example here. Again, another law, again, applying to the Department of Commerce. Title 44, hey, every year, every single agency has to put together an annual report of how well their security programs are going. And in that report, they have to tell you about every major incident they suffered that year. This is so that NIST, through the Department of Commerce, which they are a part of, can review these reports and identify if new security controls need to be created. That report has to include all the threat actors involved, the vulnerabilities exploited, the impacts. And that report can't be classified because fewer people could read it. It has to be an unclassified document. This and one other related title, which just tells you to keep these secrets uh, or keeps these, keep these reports uh, confidential, is literally the entire authority for the category of information systems vulnerability information in the CUI registry. That's it. Are any of you putting together an agency annual report talking about your systems vulnerabilities that were exploited? Okay, so how many people here, I'm curious, have been told by a vendor or a consultant or an attorney that vulnerability information about your systems are CUI? Okay, yeah, a non-zero amount. So that is not going to fit inside of this incredibly limited authority for this particular category. I think a common problem we get into is that people believe that CUI is a list of everything that's sensitive, just everywhere, and it's not. It's only where these overlapping conditions are satisfied that something becomes CUI. There's plenty of information around us that is still sensitive, and we should absolutely safeguard. And in the future, additional executive orders, as they start to trickle down into the contracting base, will probably want you to do something about your own system vulnerability information. But this authority is incredibly limited. Unless it's a once a year report from an agency, it doesn't fall into this category. So don't let someone tell you that you know, information about your systems are ISVI. It's not possible. So here's the one we all probably showed up for. We have a federal rule that says, hey, contracts officers put a specific contract clause in all contracts except something that's for a commercial off the shelf procurement. Uh, that federal rule then trickles down into the follow on contract clause, DFARS 252-204-7012. And then we get a definition in the contract clause of something called controlled technical information. So we're, we're reading this definition and we're trying to figure out what qualifies as CTI. This might feel strange, right? Because it feels like we skipped some steps. I mean, usually you start at the law, then you go down into a federal rule, then you get guidance, and then you get a contract clause. The contract clause just says this is what it is with, without really helping you or pointing back to uh, another regulation outside of the acquisition regulations or a specific law. Super confusing, right? But we are told one thing, that uh, controlled technical information, in order to be CTI, it meets certain criteria, certain criteria that are in a DOD instruction document called 523024. So that is where we have to go back to in order to get more information. That document, 523024, was just revised on January 10th. So we are talking about sweeping revisions to this concept. And there's some really specific things going on in this newly revised document. Uh, we are told just you know, in, in the introductory information for the document that, hey, this is gonna establish an overall framework for correct marking of documents within the DOD. It's gonna align with things that we see described in the CUI program as well. But then as we go further into some of these descriptions, it's also gonna tell us that this now, this new guidance aligns with the DOD's own CUI program in 5248. So these are now talking to each other and they understand each other. And then finally, we're told a new piece of information that I think is important for all of us. All unclassified controlled technical information must now be marked as CUI, full stop. CUI is gonna be marked in the header and footer in a special title box in the first page and in individual portions if needed. And what you're gonna to start to see now is sort of a fusion of things that we've been asking for for years. I need properly marked CUI, great. All new documents generated by the DOD will start to have this. 
Uh, bad news for you, legacy documents are not on the document for, for collection and remarking. Although if you go to redistribute it as DOD, they're supposed to add these markings before they send it out. And then obviously for anything newly created. Most of us work through prime contractors who are not agencies. So there will be years and years of prime owned data just recirculating that won't have these new markings on it unless something changes. But uh, if you're looking at those resources we gave you, uh, you're gonna find a couple of things. There's a CUI marking reference on the second page that just has these markings if that's easier for you to you know, pinch and zoom on or something like that. Uh, but notice the, the similarities between a DOD distribution statement and the actual CUI designation indicator, uh, which is called a CDI, that's not confusing. Uh, so the, the, the uh, CUI designation indicator really contains the same information that's in an original DOD distribution statement. It's gonna give you the controlling body who's controlling that information. It's gonna give you the letter code of a DOD distribution statement that's been on documents since the 80s. Um, maybe of interest though, it's also gonna give you the CUI category. And those CUI categories are something that in DOD distribution statements used to be called reasons or reason codes for assigning a certain distribution statement. Uh, those still exist, they now represent the, the CUI categories that we need to be aware of. So if we get into some of those defense categories, uh, I just have listed the ones here that are pre-approved for distribution to DOD components and their contractors. There are others, I just couldn't cram them all into this list. Uh, the ones that are in gray here are going away, they're deprecated, they're not in the new guidance. They have been replaced with either one of the new uh, defense categories or they're just not in use anymore. So you, you might still see those out in the wild they're not gonna be used anymore. But each and every one of these defense categories is only here because behind it, there is either a law or a regulation governing that data set, that information type. So if there's a takeaway from this, it's that the real CUI registry for DOD contractors isn't the, DOD, isn't the CUI registry. It's the laws and regulations that are behind these categories that are gonna be most commonly appearing when you're doing DOD subcontracted work. There are laws behind these that are not in the CUI registry. Doesn't it seem strange to you that the export controlled category in the CUI registry doesn't directly reference ITAR at all? That's weird, right? It's because it's here. It's here in these defense categories. So if you can understand the laws behind these or the regulations behind these, you can truly begin to understand CUI. So let's just look at the most commonly cited reason code or defense category that we see on existing uh, distribution statements. Critical technology. Has anybody here seen a document that you get like the traditional distribution statement B, C, or D or something like that? And then it's got critical technology as the reason sort of scribbled in that paragraph block statement. Maybe you've seen one of the other ones that we were looking at. Um, critical technology is a roll up in a section of CFR that just points to a bunch of other laws and statutes. And so all of the other laws that are rolled up into this category, information related to any defense article or defense service under ITAR. ITAR lives here in critical technology. Uh, similarly, a good number of the reasons for applying export controls as a particular ECCN, if, if you're under EAR, the dual use commercial uh, product uh, export controls, if the reason an ECCN is controlled is, is one of these uh, very common reasons in the defense space, that is also going to pack into the critical technology defense category. Uh, some other things that are just sort of grab bag items that are also listed as critical technology. If you do anything with like nuclear facilities or things like that, if you get into like neurotoxins or bio agents, I don't know if anybody here like manufactures like agents for African horse sickness or something like that, but that would fall into this category. So it's this giant roll up all, of all these different laws and regulations. So this is, is gonna take some research for any organization to go through and index all of these and better understand them. Just, just take what this is trying to tell you, which is that basically any information that you receive from a customer that's going to have a DOD distribution statement, B through F on it, if properly applied, is going to be there because behind that defense category of which there could be more than one, there are, there are going to be laws and regulations that already exist and already 
govern uh, either safeguarding of that information or dissemination control, who can see that information, who you're allowed to send it to, and under what circumstances. 100% uh, of the things that are in the critical technology category are export controlled. So there, there's, that's your primary dissemination control for this. So if, if that gets us to a point where we could look at a document with a DOD distribution statement B through F on it and be willing to admit that it is CUI and that the DOD agrees that it is CUI and that I'm holding CUI, that is a win. We've gotten to our minimum viable outcome for this discussion. Now, that is going to be most helpful when we received, receive information because someone's had a chance within an agency to review and market. Now we have to sort of turn our attention to information that we create or generate. And that's where things maybe get a little trickier. To do that, we have to navigate the proprietary paradox. So I can almost guarantee you that as I talk about this information, you are going to experience a, a sort of a back and forth effect where you're like, I get it. Wait, no, now I don't understand it. That doesn't make any sense. That conflicts with this. Okay, now I think I get it. I get it. Wait, no, no, now I'm back over here. It's going to be a roller coaster. I apologize. But we have to walk you through some of these concepts to get to the conclusion. So again, we've already talked about the fact that CUI per the federal definition is something that's subject to a law or a regulation and that it's either information that the government possesses or that a, something that we possess or created for the government. But I only just read to you half of the definition of CUI in 32 CFR. This continues and the next sentence says, however, CUI does not include two things, classified information, thanks, I get it, unclassified, classified, but it also does not include information that a non-executive branch entity, that's you, possesses and maintains in its own systems that did not come from or was not created for or possessed by or for an executive branch agency or an entity acting for an agency. An entity acting for an agency might be like your, your prime contractor as an example. So we just established laws or regulations are what make something CUI and then immediately Nara is pulling the rug out from under us and saying, oh, except it's not anything that you have in your systems and maintain in your systems that didn't come from us or that you didn't make for us. Well, but doesn't, how does that carve out work? I don't understand. I, I, I just landed on a definition of what would make something CUI, laws or regulations. And now you're doing this to me, Nara. So we have to dig further into this and maybe better understand how this, this process works. Um, it, to further confound the issue, one of the defense categories for CTI in DODI 523024 is proprietary business information. And so you just told me, Nora, that things that I have in my systems are not CUI, but then now you're telling me that proprietary information is C CUI. So what the heck is going on here? Well, here, here's the nature of how this works in the contracting space. Um, we, we couldn't fit all this into a slide. So if you look, uh, I think it's on the third page, of your cheat sheet, the technical data rights cross-reference. That's gonna give you a more universal view of what we're gonna talk about here. So uh, on that sheet, what you're gonna find is several columns, starting with laws on the left and then moving into regulations, then acquisition regulation and instructions for, for acquisition professionals into the solicitation phase, into the award phase. I'm gonna burn through this absolutely as quickly as I can. Basically, there are laws that say that there are certain things that have to be incorporated into contracts that guarantee the government certain rights to information. Uh, basically, the, there's a federal rule that NARA also presides over called 36 CFR. You can see there in the, in the federal rule title. I, I kid you not, uh, the name of this federal regulation is actually named as a question. And that question is, how do agencies manage records created or received by contractors? That is literally the name of the regulation, feels important. Uh, that's actually the last page of your cheat sheet uh, and it's got some information in there. Anything that's created for the government is considered a federal record. The, the federal agencies must get a copy of it. If it's a federal record, they must have a copy of it for records keeping purposes. In order to get a copy from you, it has to be a line item deliverable on your contract. That is how this works. So the government may even request information from you that they don't even necessarily need to have rights to or own. They just need a copy for their own records for government purposes. 
So in order to do that, in order to get that from you, they are required to ask you for copies. And this is the moment in your overall contracting uh, life cycle where you are going to negotiate your rights for that data. By default, if on a non-commercial item contract, you give a piece of information to the government, they have unlimited rights. They can do whatever they want with it. They can make it public. They can send it to someone else. They can ask your competitor to make it for you. They can do whatever they want. So if you don't want that to be true for data that the government needs, you have to assert data rights. So the way that that usually works is that you are going to give a list to a contracts officer with all of the data rights that you wish to exert for individually named documents that you're going to provide to the government. At some point, that's agreed upon. And then you are required to put specific markings on those documents. If you go back to, I think, the second page of the cheat sheet where we have the CUI marking examples, on the right side, we'll have two examples of government purpose rights markings and limited rights markings. That's how you tell the government, hey, either for like up to five years, you can't, you can't use this for any commercial purposes. Uh, or at any time forever, this information belongs to me. You've got to get permission to send it to someone else. So th that's basically how you tell the government that you are limiting their rights for that data. The moment that you do that, the government has to respond because they now have an obligation to safeguard that data and control its dissemination. So they will put the proprietary business information reason as the reason for assigning a particular distribution statement on the document you send them. And then that creates what I guess we could only describe as the proprietary information paradox. And that paradox is this, NARA, is my proprietary information CUI? Well, the government will protect it as CUI and may even send it back to you as CUI. But the proprietary information you create internally and maintain ownership of is not CUI, although it's still regulated. Okay, so what is happening right now? So the, the problem with these definitions is that some of these definitions are written for the federal audience. Remember, the CUI program is not for you. It was written for agencies. The only way it makes the jump to you is through an agreement. And so from the federal government's perspective, if they get a piece of information from you, their perspective is that it is CUI. They will mark it as such. They will make sure it doesn't go to your competitors. Who here has gotten back their own pricing sheet from DCAA marked as either propin or source selection? Yeah. You're getting your own stuff marked back as CUI. That is to stop them from sending it to your competitor. So that is why they are marking it the way they are marking. Some of these dissemination authorities are pretty much contained within the federal agency space and their functions. But th the government can't just lay claim to your data rights and now own your information. So the information that you never shared with them in the first place that's still on your hard drive for you because you own it is not CUI. So you could literally have two copies of the same information, one with you, one with them. This one's CUI, this one is not. And hence we have ourselves the paradox. So this is by no means something that you figure out in one go, in one repetition. You have to sort of talk yourself through a reason set of questions to ask yourself about who owns the data, who will have a copy of it? Where did this originate from? Things of that nature in order to get to the bottom of this. But just know that this is a function that exists within the CUI space, and it creates a really interesting uh, possibility for contractors. By correctly marking your data with the right assertions when you send it out, you just made something CUI for the government. Did you know you had that power? I, don't, I can't think of a more advantageous position to be in as a defense contractor than a situation where the rules don't apply to your internal data, but they do apply outside your own four walls. That, that's something that we should explore further as an industry. So pushing back on lazy CUI definitions, it's, it's something that we always end up having to do. And at some point, someone will probably walk up here and telling me that I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much, I'm going through too many things. So I, I apologize if I have to move quickly on this. But the first thing we have to push back on is, everything you get from the customer CUI. Because you've gotten this answer before when you've asked someone, right? Uh, that simply cannot be true. Public information cannot be CUI. Cannot be. Ask the DOD. Ask NARA. Public information that's released without any prior restrictions cannot be CUI. 
So when I talk to contractors who get their contract award and it's section marked, and the only sections of their contract that are section marked are the name of their business, the contract number, the dollar amount, and the name of the award, and everything else is UUI. Those are the only parts of the contract that are public. All of that information is on usaspending.gov. I would rather you had marked the whole contract that way, and yet does these crazy marking situations arrive. And so we, we know that on some level, information that could be in a document or the entire document itself isn't CUI. That's why FCI even exists as a concept. That's why the DOD is doing backflips to describe something called unclassified non-public DOD information for research grants. There's all these other things that something could be other than CUI. To say that everything is CUI is maybe not always helpful. So from there, uh, you know, there, there's possibilities that we can, we can go through on that. I'll get to some of them. But the, the second lazy definition that we'll get is, um, oh, sorry. I'm going to skip by this because there's actually a typo in this. Um, applicable statutes or regulations are what makes something uh, CUI when it's agency data. But uh, agency data with no law or regulation is probably something else, right? It could be FCI. It could be simply non-public covered under an NDA. It could be public information. We don't know, but it's not necessarily uh, CUI just because you received it. Uh, second lazy definition, everything you create is CUI. Just magically through the law of CUI transference, your Jimmy John's order, which is technically a specification, uh, is now CUI because you created it or developed it in the performance of the contract. That is not how 36 CFR understands federal records. That is not how the agencies are instructed to request line item deliverables, which is the constraint of the agreement that limits your involvement in the CUI program. So we have to be understanding here that not everything you generate, especially things that you own, that nobody else has shared rights to, that stay inside your four walls, uh, the idea that that could be CUI makes no sense based on the clarifications we're getting from NARA. So again, if I've got a contract deliverable and there's a law or regulation that applies to it, of course it's going to be CUI, of course, because that is the, the minimum conditions by which something would be CUI in the federal definition. But if I've got a contract deliverable and no law or regulation applies to it, it's probably just FCI. It's just non-public elements of my contract. Um, if it's not a deliverable at all, but there is a law or a regulation that applies to it, guess what? It's regulated. It was regulated when you woke up. It was regulated the day you created it. That's what regulations that apply to you outside of a contract are for. You can still go to federal prison for export control violations for data that isn't CUI. So the idea that CUI is the container in which all sensitive things live doesn't make sense. There is, there's still data that you absolutely are required to protect and limit and, and dissemination control uh, because of existing laws and existing regulations. I'm sorry that CUI isn't the, the world size container that you can fit all of that in, but that, that's, that's sometimes an overlap, sometimes not. The other lazy CUI definition that we're gonna run into is just ask your contracting officer. We've, we've probably already beat this to death this morning, but your contracts officer is probably not studying every possible law or regulation for, for technical data that they don't generate, that they don't deal with as a program manager, uh, that they don't deal with down in the weeds as a subject matter expert. Uh, they are probably going to give you uh, an easy answer for them to give with as few disincentives as possible, which is uh, all of it, just all of it CUI, or I don't know, or uh, read the CUI registry and you know figure it out or whatever that might be. Here's some possibly better ways that we as an industry can shape these interactions that we have in the government contracting space. Uh, from a best practices perspective, I think we all owe it to ourselves to actually create a running list of every document we got so far on a solicitation and then subsequently in, in a contract life cycle. Uh, if you can index and inventory every document you've gotten then you put yourself into a position to understand whether it's marked as CUI, whether it qualifies as CUI, and start tracking that for each contract or each program or project. Uh, I know that's extra work, but it will save your bacon later. Uh, we also need to know about every data deliverable we are on the hook to create. So whether that's in the same list or a different tab of the same list or in a different list altogether, I need to be writing down every data deliverable, every seed roll, every test and, test and compliance report, everything I'm gonna kick out to the customer and I need to use my contract review processes to understand whether I'm being told 
to mark that with a distribution statement or whether I've got a more forward thinking agency component is actually telling me to put an actual CUI marking on it because that is going to help me understand whether it qualifies as a contract deliverable to be CUI in the first place. I highly discourage waiting until the end of contract performance when you're packaging up your deliverables to then decide how you're going to mark them because your engineer is going to send it anyways. So what I would recommend every organization does is to create pre-marked document templates that already have CUI designation boxes on the first page, that already have header and footer markings. Read what the contract deliverable says you're supposed to mark the document as. Mark an empty document that way. Fill it with content later. That will make sure that you always have the correctly marked document ready and staged for delivery, and there won't be any mistakes. And then finally, you need to get into the, the habit of creating a data report. Because so many of you are in subcontracted relationships, you don't have access to a security classification guide from the agency. You'll never see it. If you try to reach out to the PM, they'll say, who are you? So you need to control your own destiny on this. You need a reverse SCG. If you, if you have a list of everything that you've got and everything you've generated, simply report that out to your customer and say, hey, as a value added service, We've gone ahead and indexed everything that you've sent us and everything that we'll be sending you. Here's its markings. Here's whether or not it's CUI. Have a good day. No ask. Just, I'm just informing you. Here's what we've got. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Maybe don't even say that part. But you've, you've done the part <laughs> where you have informed them of your awareness of the CUI in that contract. And now there's, there's on record, here's what we knew. Here's, what, here's why we chose to act. We have a rationale for what we're doing. So every organization from a process perspective, you need a CUI identification review. You need to be able to know if you're staring at CUI. Uh, if, if you're reading the new guidance from DOD that all distribution statement mark documents are also CUI, this gets a lot easier. When we talk about deliverables, it gets a little more difficult, but we need to know whether or not a document that's staring us in the face is CUI. We also need to disqualify certain things as CUI. Uh, if something is not correctly marked, and we see that it's mostly public information or it's mostly information that would qualify as FCI or something like that, we need to know where it lands in, in that determination process. So knowing when something didn't qualify based on our review process is just as important. We also need to start developing, and this is, this is really important industry-wide, we need to know what information we cannot take off of a CUI mark document that if we put it onto a brand new document would also make that document CUI. So if we get uh, information from a government owned source or from a prime acting on behalf of a government uh, agency and it's marked as CUI or it's marked with a distribution statement and we know that it's export controlled, I need to be very careful about which fit form and function data I'm gonna take off of that document and put into another document and understand whether or not based on who owns it, I should be uh, able to do that without making that other document or that other data set CUI. I also need to develop an information allow list. You're gonna get technical data that's marked as CUI and it's totally CUI, but there will be information nested in that, that drawing or on that document that on its own would not be CUI. Who here's ever gotten a mil spec on a drawing that you can just Google and pull down from every spec? Public information is not CUI. Taking that, just that spec and putting it on another document that's gonna include your technical data would not make that document CUI. A non-public spec may, that's where we need to know the difference. There are other things that you could take off of these documents that would also uh, you know, not, not fall within the purview of being governed by an applicable law or regulation. Laws or regulations are what will drive all of this, but if something falls outside of that, then we should be able to move it onto a document and having an allow list of what we do and do not move becomes really important. Another thing, and this is maybe a more emerging school of thought, but I think we need to explore the idea of synthetic information. Uh, I was first exposed to this, this concept when talking with a software developer and it was, it was just fascinating because they basically said, um, we develop all of the software that we want the government to buy using effectively fake data fake PII, fake PHI, so that all the workflows work. Then once the government agrees to buy that software from us, 
I take this, I take the code, we ship it, we take it over to the government, and then they populate it with real data. By doing that, I was able to, you know, sort of abstract our commercial software development and get that to a point where the development processes weren't subject to these requirements because they don't contain any CUI. So things of that nature, I think, are really interesting ways for us to understand how we might be able to shape our own future. Um, if, if I can find like a public uh, engineering specification that I can buy for a, a few bucks on a specific website, and that engineering spec does all the same things as something that's being described to me in a government technical data set, I've done two things at that point. I've, I've proven to myself that this is just generally a commercial performance capability. And that would also allow me to, start to think about whether specific technical data that I'm gonna build using those public or commercially available specs is actually what's called required as technical data under export controls because it's not directly contributing to like weird outsized performance requirements. It's just a general commercial thing that generally things can do as commercial dual use items. So those are some of the things we can think about. Um, I think that pretty much carries us through uh, everything that we wanted to cover here in the, just the prepared slides. So again, data rights are your key to determining whether something you will send out is CUI, and it's important to do that whenever you can. Uh, if you can identify whether CUI is uh, present in your organization, you have much more control over how many of your IT systems and components and business processes touch this data, and then you can actually limit your scope reduce cost or complexity. And then anytime that you can leverage either proprietary data or public unrestricted data to get the same job done, uh, that's always gonna be a win for you because it's gonna preserve your supply chain. Uh, you can get information to suppliers more easily without needing to do flow downs. So uh, that's all I had from, from our perspective. Our, our team at DevCert does a lot of these CUI scoping and determination projects to help organizations establish a working definition of CUI and then use that to carry forward into how they change business process and determine their true scope for implementing this 8171. So uh, sale, salesy stuff off to the side. Let's get to whatever questions we have with the time we have remaining. All right, let's, uh, let's do one online and then we'll go to some here in the room. So uh, this question about system telemetry data, for example, system health diagnostic support data and such that can't be individually marked, how do we handle that? So we were talking about like raw telemetry feeding off some machine or something like that. That's what it sounds like. Okay. I, I'm not asking the question, so I don't Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Scott, you should know. Uh, here's, here's some things that we should keep in mind, right? If it's, if it's technical data, there's a very good chance that it's on a DOD platform going to be export controlled, right? So depending on the end, the end item that telemetry data is for, a tank versus a satellite versus a submarine, there are very different rules of engagement for what is export controlled based on the end item it's coming out of. And then subsequently, whether it's subject to the ITAR or whether it's subject to EAR, specific ECCNs will tell you, oh, hey, satellite companies, uh, basic telemetry data for like tracking and keeping your birds from falling out of the sky, course correction, none of that stuff's export controlled. Have a good day. If it's something coming off of a land vehicle, that has a, a different USML category or it's a different ECCN, the rules could be different. So just knowing whether it's regulated in the first place is really the key to unlocking a lot of this. But if the data itself isn't regulated, then it's gonna fall below the minimum threshold for qualifying as CUI, regardless of who's gonna own that data or who's gonna get a copy. That's the, the critical linchpin for all of this. So just knowing that I think would be the easiest way to figure that out. Pretty regularly we see situations where telemetry data and metadata doesn't qualify as CUI. Hey, Ryan. Uh, thanks for the presentation, it was awesome. Uh, so let's say I have a friend that has a very large SharePoint site that's got like millions of documents in it. And I know that I've got CUI, ITAR, all kinds of stuff in it. It's CAD drawings, PDFs, images, Word documents, Excel documents, everything, right? Some of it may be labeled, some of it may not. How would you approach that problem in trying to figure out which documents contain ITAR, CUI, whatever, and properly label them and control them? So the, the first thing we should just be aware of is that, just to help the IT admins in the, in the crowd, if there's even one CUI document in that system, it's a covered contractor information system if under a DOD contract. So 
knowing that we have to now go hard in the system helps us make progress even while we're figuring out that challenge. So I don't want the lack of complete clarity on CUI to slow down progress. If that data flow or that business process or that IT system is known to handle CUI from one time or, or another, then it, we should get started on 800 But to answer your question, it's largely unhelpful to do searches based on export control statements because like, you know, hot sauce, they put that on everything, including emails that don't even actually contain the information. Uh, and remember, not all regulated data is CUI, so you could have false positives there. What I would target early and often to identify data stores or entire SharePoint sites or entire folders, whatever would give me that early test that I've got something in that environment, uh, would be to actually use strings of text from the DOD distribution statements that come on documents. Those are always going to be CUI, right? So like in that example that we had, uh, this one was distribution statement E. There's a string of text that says distribution authorized to DOD only. That string of text is always unique and it's never changed in a document that, that has a distribution statement. That will be a very durable search term and a string to go get out of a document to see if it is actually CUI or not. So whether you're using something like a, a Microsoft Information Protection product or some other sort of crawling indexing document that does OC, or a tool that does OCR or whatever that might be, those little strings of text would be an excellent way to quickly identify data sets that include CUI. Hi, Ryan. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, one of the questions that I get asked quite regularly, uh, especially by manufacturers, is they'll try and enclave off the CUI in their engineering documents, their specifications, but they'll often have a commercial side with the actual machines that make the things. And the machine code or the, the CAD instructions um, I just get the question over and over and over again, is that CUI? Because it's obviously not labeled, it's like machine instructions. Can you talk to that? So I love working with manufacturers who design their own parts or act as an OEM. And the reason for that is they have a commercial proprietary data set that they are leveraging or doing minor modifications to to meet DOD needs. And so there, there's a preserved data set that they can run through their machines in production and things like that, while still setting aside government received or customer received data sets and use the knowledge from those to make sure that they're gonna meet specs, but still have all of this commercial data. So what I like to go through are exercises uh, to understand, do I actually need to bring customer data over into my commercial design in order, to, uh, in order to actually produce it. So for, for example, you know, we've worked with organizations who build like large completed assemblies, right? They're not, they're not just simple parts, right? It's, it's a complete saleable product and they're just adding some new inputs or outputs to that product, maybe like a, a new intake manifold or a new exhaust port or you know, something like that. Like, so let's say like it's an engine or something like that. When you get into those types of situations, a lot of times, the only thing that needs to change about their product is integration points. And for the most part in commercial dual use, just fit information for the purposes of interchangeability is supposed to be unrestricted so that you can create MOSAs, you know, modular open systems architectures. So usually just fit information being adjusted like, oh, this mounting bracket or this position isn't enough to make that information um, derive from like a CUI data set. If I change the function of something, or if I drastically change the form of something, that can become more likely. So what we'll see organizations do is literally a space claim. They'll make like a big red box or a shape or a blob, and then they'll just attach the, the mating point for the DOD platform that their stuff needs to attach to, but no other real context, right? So they, they, use, they build that off of the really high detailed drawing that they get from the customer. And then they forget that drawing ever existed. They moved the blob into their design teams and they made up their product to it. Always design up to this mating point, this bolt pattern, but don't worry about what's out here. And they'll use tools like that to, to keep their data set distinct from what's happening with customer data sets without bringing over any of the manufacturing process data or form fit or function data 
from their customers' data sets that would create bleed over. So those are some of the, the strategies we've seen deployed that can be just in, uh, unbelievably valuable for keeping CUI data sets over there with your sales teams, with your quoting teams, even in pre-production engineering, but making sure that the data that flows through production is not going to be CUI because it's your proprietary data. It's not leaving your four walls. No one else owns the rights to it. All right, so rapid fire time on these ones. Last three. Uh, thank you for that question. So that was part of the answer, but I have a very specific uh, question. So we get something that we consider as the CUI, but in order to manufacture this, we have to sort of construct the machine code, okay? So now we have a machine code. What do we, is that is considered CUI? Because now if it does, we have to protect it in our enclave, whatever we have. Mm -hmm. If not, then we just keep it on our hard drives. Usually machinists are, you know, like they, engineers generate that code, machinists, you know, copy that code on a USB drive or some kind of, you know, access, they have to access to the network. Sure you know, using FTP or using some kind of, uh, you know, things that are not really considered to be very secure, you know, in that environment. So now do our, uh, do we consider this as a protected uh, and like uh, information because we just create a machine code for it. And the other question is like, we get um, a part to manufacture. Now we have to manufacture this part. Then we have to send that part to, um, you know, because metal gets stressed, so we have to go and send it to de-stress it, which is sure. like a big furnace, right? A, a process provider. A, yeah. That's right, process provider. So we send that part. We don't send anything else. You know, we just send him, you know, some information to de-stress it. Sure. Okay. Then that part comes back. We have to send it to, let's say, so, chroming. Yeah. So, so what, I, what I'm hearing is, uh, is, is our internal production process data going to qualify as CUI. And then secondarily, if I need to send a part out, will that qualify? Uh, every, every different uh, organization's context for those will, will vary and could put you over the edge to make something CUI. Um, just the fact that someone's providing a simple process doesn't have anything to do with whether something's CUI or not. It depends on whether the data you have to send for them to do the simple process is CUI. And it's because it's all about the information, it's not about the part or things like that. So let's say I assume that um, uh, I send the part, but I have to send them a drawing. Part of that sure, part. so you have to send a drawing in order for them to know and what process to perform. That drawing yeah. doesn't say anything what it is. It sure. It says that you have to put like, you know, one millimeter of coating on it or something like that. Sure. Would that be us putting us in a like, very peculiar position to, to, to be responsible for this? Like it's a CUI, we have to, you know, like, so if, like, one thing I can't do is I can't just take my customer's name off a drawing and say, not CUI anymore, and then just send it off. Like, it, the, the name wasn't what made it CUI in the first place, so taking it off doesn't give us that net effect. Um, divorcing something from its context would only, get, would only take us so far. It's probably not going to stop something from being <laughs> CUI. It was, still, it was still probably regulated, and it's not owned by us. So that's, that's always a point of order or a concern. If I'm going to send a customer drawing to a supplier, I don't own that. I can't guarantee that the government doesn't have rights to it. And it's definitely received in a contract and it's probably subject to a law or regulation. That feels like CUI. So just re repeating or resending a, draw a customer drawing, always problematic for your supply chain. What I think is more sustainable and more defensible is thinking about whether or not net new data sets that we might create internally, like a new manufacturing process, for example, your G-code example. Um, because, that, because you own that, you never owe anyone a copy of it. If you can think about whether you would still retain the rights to that, uh, even though it may still be regulated, it's probably still export controlled. You're not scot-free, right? Uh, there are still dissemination controls, but that net new data set may not be considered CUI because it isn't, it's not being delivered on a contract. So that, that is where we have to make some really hyper-specific determinations. It is a hey, lot Ryan. harder. Hey, Ryan. Sorry, man. Hey, so lunch is waiting. 
Uh, we have a bunch of questions that are queued up, and I think that this is a really awesome session. So I want to steal just a few minutes to get to our question in the middle, and then one more on the, on the other side, as long as we can do rapid fire, and then we'll have to do question follow-ups afterwards at lunch. I apologize. All right, so I'll just give you like one sentence answers. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, so right Next. here in the middle. Yes, sir. Um, yes, yeah, so we deal with mostly generating the CUI. We know it's CUI that it actually ends up at the final customer. Um, and we all we deal strictly with data. So it's massive bits of data. We may be generating these massive sets of data. We might be filtering and doing all kinds of analysis. Some of that data ends up to the customer at the end. We have spreadsheets and, and scripts and all over our SharePoint, you know, are all those working pieces of document or would those also be considered CUI if there's one thing that came out of the document that ended up in the final CUI document? Who owns it? Who ends up possessing a copy? Next. <laughs> Hi. So, ooh, a little too close. Um, I'm just going to go to the easy question. Yesterday, it was mentioned that we should be using the DOD CUI registry, not the NARA CUI registry, although the DeFAR 7012 specifically references the NARA CUI registry. So what are your thoughts on that? Which one should we be using? Because the marking in that is a little, it's different. Like if you actually look at it. Um, <laughs> so the, the question is, how should I mark this? Because there's two different instruction sets for marking. Whatever your customer says. Next. <laughs> 